for the love of fuck I hope this works, I'm trying to defeat the completely arbitrary auto sage that has killed my last two attempts at story timing, gonna repost my standard clarifications here before I get started. So, I'm reposting the big chunk of story time 12 that got lost because it wasn't worth archiving the amount of content that I put out, so if you've seen this already, bear with me. I've got the time, so I can keep posting for at least 2 or 3 hours. As per usual, all of the past threads except 3 are here. Also, as I always remind people, shadow run story time functions as a shadow run general as well. Feel free to discuss the system and setting here because lord knows aside from the slowpoke hey have you heard about the kickstarter threads no one ever talks about Shadoran here. Now, back to the story. The go gang collapsed, girdling, to the floor of the alleyway. Blood ran in thin streams over the collar of her leather jacket, escapees from Geppetto's searching fangs. Surveying the deep gouges on her neck as he produced his handkerchief to wipe his pale, colorless lips, the banshee figured that she'd probably live. Probably. The wound certainly wasn't fatal on its own, but that wasn't how a banshee killed. She live in body, and then only for so long. She'd probably show up under a bus in a few months, another unfortunate victim of hopelessness and societal stagnation. What a senseless waste of human life, commented Geppetto, with more referential humor than legitimate concern, as he used the heel of his loafer to nudge his victim further into the debris of the alleyway before returning to the streets near his apartment, picking up his briefcase again and continuing his walk home. Geppetto was in a good place. He used the proceeds from the bank job to buy a nice apartment in the mob neighborhood in Tacoma, near to Wildcard's place. He had a nice trade subscription, comfortable furniture, and tasteful decorations. Home was now a nice place to return to after feeding or working, rather than a necessity. And boy, did it feel great to stroll through his doorway into a room with proper air conditioning, apartment, climate control on, let's get to dry 62 degrees. Can do, Geppetto, announced Geppetto's blender. Do you want to play? No thanks, I've got a little stuff to catch up on, commented Geppetto, but thanks. After about 5 seconds, Geppetto remembered that his blender couldn't talk. Wait, what the fuck? Geppetto spun around to find the entirety of his kitchen appliances arrayed in a little battalion on the counter. Considering that he was naturally a hemivore, he'd never had much use for a blender or a toaster. However, despite his recent inexperience with such devices, he was pretty sure that they weren't supposed to be marching towards him a toy story with unknown intent. Uncle Geppetto looks scared, announced the microwave. What should we do? Hugs the egg beater spun its whisks, beginning to chant. Hugs. As the appliances began to pick up their pace, Geppetto began slowly backing out of the room. There was a disconcerting whining from above him. Geppetto looked up to see his blender sitting atop the fridge, blades whirling freely. Time seemed to move in slow-mo as it jumped for him. Who who hugs? Geppetto had murdered someone in an alleyway not 15 minutes ago, and this was still something he was not prepared to deal with. After briefly considering its options, his lizard brain opted for flight. Ah uh, uh, uh. Geppetto stumbled into his living room, knocking over his couch on the way in. He screamed to his home node, home chn, home chn, close the kitchen door, close the kitchen door. The house did not comply, as Geppetto's reading lamp hopped over the fallen couch, nudging against the vampire's tailcoats. It mournfully asked, don't you like hugs, Uncle Geppetto? The wine returned as the blender hopped out of the kitchen with its buddy's food processor and vacuum cleaner. Falling into an awkward roll over the ruins of the couch, Geppetto continued sprinting towards his bedroom, only to find that the adjacent bathroom's shower head had somehow become ambulatory and was busy crawling across his bedspread, acting like an explorer on an umbilicus. It cried, surprised. We've been discovered. Cheese it, boys. As Geppetto saw his entire supply of disposable comlinks and his electric toothbrush flee from under his bed to the undersides of his other furniture, he began to babble freely. No longer capable of producing coherent responses to the madness that was once his unobtrusive urban apartment. In a final bid of desperation, Geppetto threw himself bodily into his closet and slammed the door shut. A few flashlights milled around his feet, nuzzling against his ankles, but none were capable of doing the damage of, say, a blender. This worked. This was fine, Geppetto had a call to make, Raz Seattle personnel, who are you looking for? Security Director McWilliams. Make it snappy, may I ask who's calling, sir? Just connect me to him. A short pause later, and 2D's nasal tones resounded over Geppetto's comlink. Oh, hey, um, hi, Geppetto, 
You're probably wondering, why are there sprites in my apartment? You're wondering, why are there sprites in my apartment Twody? Wondering why, I want them to go away Twody, why? I hear slams on the door Twody, I think my mini fridge is trying to break in. There was a brief pause, and then Geppetto's home CHN announced, in 2D's voice. Okay, kids, show's over, everyone back to your places. Explain, well, I was telling you that. New. Okay, you cool now? Geppetto sighed and slumped down against the back wall of his closet, giving Geppetto a clear view of all of his appliances carefully returning to their respective places, now in full Toy Story mode. Okay, yep. I'm done. Why have you ruined the subtle balance of calm and tranquility that is my life, 2D? Well, I'm not allowed to keep sprites on the building server anymore. If they got up to this shit, 2D, I can understand why. Well, actually, they found the launch codes. What? You know, the big ones. What the actual fuck, 2D, yep. On the 4th of July I had to stop them from accidentally nuking the complex during the fireworks display. Incidentally, you can thank me for saving Seattle from nuclear Armageddon anytime. Point being until they can understand real world consequences I'm letting them gestate in an environment with less of said consequences. Geppetto growled between his teeth. Namely, my house. Well, yeah. I couldn't use just anyone's house. That would be unprofessional. Geppetto's cry of rage was so intense that his electric shaving razor fell over and then hid in the sink. Give me one good reason that I shouldn't just sell this apartment and then proceed to dedicate the rest of my shattering career to ruining your life. 2D. Well, for one, I can pay off, like, half your rent. Well that is a very good reason. And that was how Geppetto's apartment got the sprite magnet quality. The mill spec suit felt right. Devish had recently had it upgraded at the Raz facility. The hydraulics were improved, the whole thing was lined with anti-thermal metamaterials, and to top it all off, they added new ports for his more exotic blade locations. Truly, Raz was a discriminating force in the world of power armor. It also helped having the team's old hacker in a cushy position in the company. Man, Dervish was so happy to have 2D working Raz these days. It just made everyone on the team's lives easier. As Dervish jetted over a low, crumbling section of the Redmond Wall, flying at low altitude over the rubble and dirt of the Barons, he received a text from Jose Rodriguez. His surrogate father sensei, Hey son, problems at home. I am probably gonna head out on the old horse cart for a little while. You go ahead and see for yourself. With a shrug, Dervish continued home, knocking over the crappy hingeless plank that functioned as his door. He noticed that, weirdly, a lot of the booby traps had been set off but there were no obvious bodies. And these booby traps would leave bodies, or he wasn't looking at a shotgun duct tape to a wall. All was answered when he turned the corner to find a high force nuclear spirit sitting on his dilapidated couch, absently hucking body parts at a wall with its telekinesis. It turned its featureless, blinding white face to him. So, um, the nuclear spirit remained silent. Are those gangers? Yes. Are you painting my wall? I like the squish noise. The spirit gestured at a mangled corpse, which promptly hovered into the air and then rocketed at high speed into the opposite wall. The nuclear spirit giggled. How long are you planning on doing that? Until I run out of bodies. You count as bodies, by the way. Devish surveyed the pile of bodies behind the couch. The spirit probably had a couple more throws worth. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go, don't let me stop you. As Dervish awkwardly exited out of the broken down building again, he saw his old, blind, tattooed master pass by on a wooden cart filled with weapons, drawn by a three-legged horse. You down for a road trip, son? Yep. Dad, I think I really need a job. It's the economy, son. Fucks all of us in the end. Ho, oh, lucky. Yeah. how you holding up, Dylan? Wildcard shrugged. He was sitting in a torn up on chair in the lobby of an old medical clinic in Redmond, sharing tea with his street doc. Ancient signs were everywhere, Dr. Julia Green was paid up with them, and they certainly kept the riffraff out of the block, as well as can be expected, I guess. The run in business is weird, Green was a stern, hawkish looking woman. If she were a decade older, she would resemble the villainous matron from some Victorian orphan tale. As it were, she simply looked like the slightly more youthful version of said villainous matron. Ah, distinctions. Am I gonna be seeing you for Cyberblades and more wired anytime soon? Whenever I get runners in it's all they ask for. Wildcard chuckled and sipped his iced tea, briefly propping his mask up to avoid spilling on it.
With any luck. No. Funny. Though. I got a partner who'd be right up your alley. Well. Runners aren't normally my type. Wildcard. Said Green. With a thin smile. As she looked at the bizarre foot traffic of gangers. Beggars. And criminals that passed down the block. Although if his money's good I'll take as much as he's willing to give. I could forward you his number. But that'd be redundant. Commented Wildcard. Green cocked an eyebrow. Oh. Because the idiot just went by in his red, white and blue power armor on a horse drawn carriage. Oh why, Began. Over here. It did not take Dervish long to want to get more wear. Namely, he heard Wildcard utter the words, friend, trust, and discount, and promptly begged to go under the knife. Since he'd been looking for someone who would do upgrades to his highly illegal Ultradon's bone structure and reaction enhancers forever. A little flensing to tune up his author skin also couldn't hurt. Green had been skeptical until she saw the amount of money Dervish was flaunting literally the rest of his share from the last run and the run before that and then invited him to the operating table. As she was working on the bones of his cranium, cutting down into the bone to fit in the mesh inserts that would eventually harden and strengthen the skull, she found a minor problem and called Wildcard over. First, Wildcard, your friend here is costing me a fortune in anesthetics. He keeps coming awake again. You didn't tell me this bastard had metabolic enhancers. He's like a metahuman goddamn weapon. Dervish groaned and reached absently for the hole in his skull, prompting Green to slam another syringe of morphine into his arm. Its four brothers and sisters lay in the hazardous waste bin to the side. Yeah, Dervish is like that, said Wildcard, with a shrug. What's the second? Green handed Wildcard a Petri dish with a .308 on the piercing round in it, deformed heavily and covered in grey matter. The slightly more pressing issue is that there was a bullet in his brain. Considering the growth around it I'd hazard it's been there for a year. Wildcard, of course, had no idea about Dervish's unfortunate run-in with the sniper at the very start of the two times arc. Shouldn't he be dead? You'd think so, but all I'm getting are some weird brainwave pattern. Like some parts of the frontal cortex shutting off when you jigger the wound around. Either way, I'll try to implant some additional grey matter. Your boy here's got a typo system, so luckily I don't need to worry about cloning anything. Either way, when he comes to you give him a stern talking to about getting shot in the head less. Wildcard pulled on a medical glove and looked over the bullet, curious. Well, he's a street Sammy, green. I didn't say not at all, I just said less. You're sure this guy's legit? He's one of us. Tartarus, said Mars. We don't call him Pluto for nothing. Just don't piss him off. Damien Sanatir, better known on the streets as Geppetto, was better known by his second codename, Tartarus, at the Merlin Sports Bar downtown. It was a small, homey establishment that just happened to play clubhouse for all of the different mages on the Finnegan family's payroll. Mostly the others were hermetics and Christian theurges of a decidedly corrupt Catholic bent, but Geppetto didn't mind being the only black magician there. It added a sort of murderous mystique. I've heard weird things about Pluto, Mars. I don't feel safe buying an illusion focus from a guy I've heard weird things about, Mars, a cruel looking, dark skinned mafioso adorned with hermetic fetishes, scoff, says Tartarus, the children's tales boogeyman, sacrificed any virgins lately? Please. You take me for an Aztec? Mars chuckled. Touche. Either way, this guy's as legit as any mook who's gonna sell you black magic fetishes. Take that as you will. Geppetto sighed loudly and melodramatically. I suppose I'll take what I can get. But if I die, Mars, you have to find another black magician. I'll find another Christian theurge and save myself the trouble. Mars waved Geppetto out. Get out of here. Correction Vulcan, not Pluto. Pluto was another of Geppetto's contacts. Vulcan was the special one. Geppetto drove into Redmond to find Vulcan's forge, identified on the map as a small bunker hidden in a large chunk of blasted land and rubble from a fallen skyscraper. Foreboding music practically played in his ears as he came within sight of the block of reinforced, magic-resistant concrete adorned with gun turrets and cameras. A single large blast door covered the front facade, with large slats built into both the very top and bottom of the door. As Geppetto came within 50 feet, a voice announced over loudspeaker, as the gun turrets focused on him. No closer. Who are you? Who vouches for you? Geppetto put his hands up. I'm Tartarus, from the Merlins. I'm here to redeem that order on the black magic manipulation focus. Got anyone to vouch for that story? No, because you demanded that I not bring friends, otherwise you'd take it as an attack and kill all of us. Good, good. 
they haven't compromised your memories. Yet. Step up to the door, Geppetto stood in front of the fortified glass door. Okay, what now? The top slat opened into darkness. Stick your hand in there. What? Number. Stick your hand in there or I kill you. You could be one of them already. Who's them? Geppetto reluctantly stuck his hand into the slat, only to feel a strong hand close around his wrist, yanking it down and out of sight radius to cast spells. He roughly identified the hand as that of a dwarf, judging by the strength and the stubby little, albeit gloved, fingers clasped around his own dainty hand. Now, hey, what are you, OW, fuck. Geppetto recoiled and struggled against the blast door as Vulcan slammed a syringe into his arm and drew blood, before letting go of his arm and letting Geppetto tumble back from the slat. As soon as Geppetto's arm was clear, the slat slammed shut. What the fuck was that? The loudspeaker announced. Taking a blood sample. Insurance. Case I need to kill you in a time in the next few decades before the nuclear sites go inert. There was a pause. Hey. HMHVV. Bastard, you infected the guns all turned down to aim at Geppetto. You planning on eating me? That it? Hey Geppetto yelled, throwing his hands above his head again. That was in the damn brief. You already know that I'm infected. You think I get this fucking marshmallows and milk complexion naturally? The guns retracted. Right. Just testing you again. Imposters everywhere. Put your hand in the bottom slat. You gonna stab me again. Only if you pull anything funny. The door was configured such that, to reach into the bottom slat, Geppetto had to plaster his face against the doorframe with no visibility. A moment later, a small object fell into his hand. He retracted his hand to find a small earring made out of bone, which emanated dark magic. Pleasure doing business with you, you fucking nut. Wire me the rest of the cred when you hit the perimeter. Now march. Ben sat in an armchair in his totally normal apartment with no sprites or ghosts or ghouls or anything. He watched his totally normal trade and played with his illusion focus, a Buddhist monk's sash that he had purchased through totally legal channels. All in all, his life was looking up, since he'd bought himself a nice place with his proceeds, and was eating good, organic food. He got a call from Brianna in the middle of surfing the Matrix. Lifting his goggles, he picked up his comlink, bend. I can't reach wildcard, Geppetto, or Dervish. I think wildcard and Dervish are in, like, an underground bunker or something. Maybe an illegal business with a jammer? I don't know, and when I tried to call Geppetto I just got some dwarf yelling who are you? Who are you working for? Can you round up the team? Ben sighed, wrapped the sash around his waist, and opened his closet to retrieve his street clothes. Sure, Brianna. I'll get right on it. We got a job? Not a big one, but yet. Yeah. Looks like you'll actually get to do some good on this one, too. Ben smiled as he slipped on his Tim military vet's jacket. Heading for the door. Those are words I like to hear, Brianna. Just don't tell Geppetto. God. Skipping forward to the Johnson meet after I take a shower. See you guys in like 15 to 30 minutes. So, has anyone ever been to a BJ's bar and grill? Because that's basically where the job was. Specifically, it was in an overpriced mid-tier bar and grill in the Seattle University District, visited only by college students who had mommy and daddy's money to spend. Suffice to say, when the team approached the front desk and asked for the Johnson party, they had a sneaking suspicion as to what they would find. And it wouldn't be any crime kingpin or corp Johnson. They found a short young man with wiry hair, who couldn't be older than 19. He looked nervously at the team over his order of cheese fries, clearly completely out of his league. Judging by his whimpering countenance, he'd never even seen a hardened criminal before, let alone done business with four of them. Geppetto sat down and extended a thin hand to grasp Mr. Johnson's own shaking mitt. Mr. Johnson, shall we get down to business? The Johnson gulped. Um, okay, yep. You can call me, uh, Dan. Dan Granger. In this business we don't use names. Mr. Johnson. Johnson squealed, but regained composure quickly. Um. I mean, I know that I'm Mr. Johnson. I know that, but my name is important. This job. Um. This job. It's about my sister. So you'd like, figure my name out anyway. Geppetto raised an eyebrow. I don't mean to be impolite, Mr. Johnson. But this is a brisk business. What's the job? My sister. Um. Emily Granger? She's a grad student in the School of Political Science. And she's been receiving death threats. I want you to find out who's been sending them, and, like, turn them into the police or something. Is there a reason why your sister has been receiving death threats, Mr. Johnson? Well, she's dating this guy. Uh, 
Jonathan reads. Wildcard tossed an AR window in front of Geppetto. Geppetto read the article off of the window. Jonathan reads. Running for county administrator of the university district on a liberal ticket. Going on about changing the system of crushing loans and high real estate premiums. About tearing down the legacy of the incumbent county administrator. Roger Carmichael. Conservative ticket. I can see how he'd make some enemies. Granger gulped. Yep. All the death threats are about, um, her being liberal, and about her being his whore, and all that. And she thinks she can handle it, but she can't. What do you mean by that, Johnson? She's brushing it off. She says it just comes with the territory, but I think she's in real danger. These guys are serious. At least, I think they are. Geppetto pent his fingers. Alright, Mr. Johnson, we can take care of the problem. What are you offering? Uh, I've got 10,000 new yen saved up. Geppetto frown. As a general rule, Johnson, we don't go for less than 20. Okay. 10 before, 10 after. I'll scrounge up the money. Just stop them from hurting my sister. The team's first stop was Jonathan Reese's apartment, where both he and Emily Granger lived. Hacking Granger's phone would be the first angle on finding out where the death threats were coming from. Finding Reese wasn't a problem. He and Granger lived in an on-campus apartment building, on the fourth story. Bent cloaked, Gecko gripped up, and set up one of his cameras at the window, sending the footage back down to the rest of the team in the sedan. Inside the room, sitting around a table, were six people. Reese himself, a charismatic young man with a gleaming smile, was flanked by two attractive young women, quickly identified as his girlfriend campaign advisor Emily Granger, and his secretary PR agent Lisa Dawson. Across from him sat three burlier, less charismatic athletic and frat boy types, probably some form of security or assistant. Out of curiosity, Wildcard started bringing up the student registry hacked and Reese's campaign website public, and started doing some cross-referencing. Okay, there's Reese, our girl, and Reese's assistant. The three palookas are Greg Hampton, Sheen Mater, and Peter Smith, football team, wrestling team, frat boy. Don't see what ties them into the campaign exactly, let me keep digging. Wildcard set his botnet on hacking Granger's comlink as he looked up more information on the three aforementioned palookas. Whoa, hold on, these three all have humanist leading tendencies, conservative families all. What are they doing on Reese's ticket? Dervish shrugged, dunno. Enforcement? Cut them a deal maybe? Geppetto frown, whatever it is, I don't like it. Wildcard brought up a partition of his nexus, and made a copy of Granger's comlink on it. You don't have to, that's the beauty of politics. Ever heard the phrase about the best compromise being nobody happy? Wildcard thumbed through the threats, which were mostly incoherent cries of conservative outrage peppered with threats of rape and dismemberment. Hum. Our would-be attackers got a bunch of disposables, or he's more than one person. The threats are all coming from different nodes. Devish offered. But couldn't it just be one guy doing that, you know, slaving thing? True. We'll have to find the offending comlinks to be sure. Until then, dervish, you get to shadow our girl. Gotta make sure she's not being shadowed by anyone else, capiche? Dervish stepped out of the car, donning his black leather jacket. Don't have to tell me twice. Keep in contact. The night progressed slowly. Ben stuck a bug in the room, only to find that they weren't discussing anything scandalous at all, only advertisement policy for their upcoming smear campaign on the current county administrator, Roger Carmichael. Carmichael was a distinguished, salt and pepper sort, which tripped the team out he or one of his aides certainly didn't seem the type to be sending die whore gonna rape you bitch texts 24 stroke 7. Of course, the plot began to come together when Dervish spotted the enforcer, Peter Smith, following Granger with a knife. I think we have a hint, guys. To be continued. With that, I'm going to pop out for a little while. The guys want to watch the Avengers, and I'll be fucked if I'm not going to come along. Be back around 9ish PST to finish the Granger job. It gets a lot crazier. Until then, Shadur in general. I'll keep a prize of the thread via my phone. The team made an executive decision. Namely, that it was time for Dervish to try out some of his new implants shock pads. Dervish stretched and flexed his fingers as he armed the black blocks of rubberized carbon that had replaced his fingertips as of less than a day before. There was a sharp crack as the surface buzzed with electricity. Smith turned around just in time for Dervish to grab either side of his head, at which point he squeezed the knife so hard it flew out of his grasp. 
spasmed wildly, and hit the pavement, grabbing him by his jacket. Dervish hucked the frat boy one-handed into a nearby bush, as the rest of team pulled onto the street to pick up girl watching duty. Oh man, that felt good, grinned Dervish, rifling through Smith's pockets. Okay, we got a cum link in here with some texts from an anonymous number, tells him to rough the girl up something fierce. Wildcard, you wanna backhack this? Be my pleasure. Driving slowly, Wildcard popped open a few AR windows to begin hacking the comlink. In one window he ran a trace of wireless nodes, the better to identify the phone that the message had come from when he came to it. Running his trace and trying to hack, Wildcard noticed an eminent problem. Comlink slaved. Another comlink's running it. Like we suspected. I can't hack this, not effectively, since a remote administrator's running everything right now. But that means we can find the boss by running a rudimentary trace. This whole operation's run on disposables. It's got more holes than Swiss cheese. Bend. I'm starting from the whole campus then narrowing in, seeing when our mystery comb no longer shows. Ready for a game of hot and cold? Bend lowered himself down to the first story of the building and opened his polymer-coated bag of tricks, which in this case carried a tank top and pair of shorts. Stripping the tax suit in an alley behind the building, Ben changed into the street clothes and stashed the folded up tax suit in a backpack that he'd left in the alleyway for just such an occasion. I prefer hide and go seek, wildcard, but it'll have to do. Wildcard led Ben on a merry walking speed chase around the campus. Early narrowing of the trace ruled out most of the science and arts campuses, but as wildcard hit the library and humanities building he found the node moving. It's another disposable. Maybe slave to a third system. Either way, it's on the move, headed to the history building now. I'll highlight our target on the tacnet. Bent closed on the target to find a familiar face Lisa Dawson, Reese's secretary. We got contact, said Ben, and a familiar face at that. We thinking the girl wants Granger out of the picture? Wants to get Reese for herself? Maybe, said Wildcard, but if so, then why is she slaved to another comlink? She's not the ringleader, that's the case. Maybe she hired someone else on. Suggested Geppetto. A specialist. Mobster maybe. Someone more experienced than a policy student and scaring a girl off. Or there's more to this, said Dervish, as he took some cred sticks from Smith's pockets to make the attack look like a mugging. You think you can run another trace, wildcard? Wildcard brought up the trace window. Yeah, looks like yet another disposable. Somewhere on campus. Fuck. Wildcard swore as Dawson turned her own phone off and tossed it in a garbage can. Bend. Get that phone and turn it back on. We need the master cum link. On it. Bend leaned over the trash can as soon as Dawson was out of visual contact, and retrieved the disposable. He turned it on, only to retrieve another slew of cursing from Wildcard. Bloody hell. Master cum links off, and we were so close too. Geppetto turned to Wildcard. On the plus side, we know that the assistant and the thugs are in on it. So we know what to watch out for. Except the ringleader. I guess we'll have to run surveillance, then. I guess we'll have to. You volunteering? Geppetto sat, cursing at his teammates, as he sat outside of Granger's apartment at 4 in the morning. She didn't sleep there often, preferring to stay with her boyfriend. But tonight she was sleeping in her own apartment, meaning that the team had to split up to cover both her and their suspects. Dervish was on similar duty for Reese's thugs, whereas Bend was keeping track of Reese. Wildcard had set his botnet to gathering all the information that they could on Reese's connections, and had gone to bed so he could be fresh for more hacking tomorrow. Considering that Dervish had the constitution of an ox, and Bend had adept powers that made his needs for sleep, food, drink, and air practically negligible, Geppetto was the only one actually getting tired from the ordeal, and, there was a voice in the back of his head. It was an angry voice, but its anger seemed almost soothing. We had a deal, Geppetto, it said. When it's time to sleep, I come out. In the morning, Wildcard pinged the rest of the team. Okay, the bots got into one of Reese's comms. Today's a free day, but he's hanging with the girl while the boys bounce. That means we can merge Reese duty and Granger duty. Anyone want to be put on standby? Actually, Geppetto said, meekly, I'm probably going to need to step out for a while. The hell's that supposed to mean? Wildcard's answer came in the form of a mad cackle that swiftly silenced as Geppetto's comlink turned off. Wildcard said to Bend and Dervish. I thought you were kidding about the Satan thing. As Bend and Wildcard met for lunch in the same food court that Granger and Reese were eating at Dervish stopped and only briefly so he could get back to monitoring the three stooges after a truly 
preposterous, jughead-esque amount of burgers, there was a sudden, extraordinarily loud cacophony of beeps and whirs. Everyone on campus had received a mass text simultaneously. Wildcard received a prompt that his own Nexus had sent out the messages, on command of Geppetto. Frat party tonight at Alpha Phi. Prepare for a night of hedonism and debauchery and like you have ever seen. The Lord of Darkness spares no expense. Terence Jackson says be there or miss out. Bend and Wildcard blinked and looked around as everyone in the food court started chattering about how Jackson's pulling his old shit again. And I wonder how he got it to everyone. Did he hire a hacker? A lot of people agreed to stop by to see what the deal was, including Granger and Rees. Wildcard clutched the sides of his head. Well, this just got a lot more interesting. Deciding that right now clever infiltration was no longer an asset on Rees and Granger, Bend and Dervish switched places, with Ben following Rees's thugs. And Dervish and Wildcard tailing the wayward couple. Wildcard and Dervish made the frat party shortly after Granger and Rees, only to find themselves accosted by two figures. One was Geppetto, who had somewhere along the line lost his suit and donned a sideways baseball cap. A not tonight ladies I'm here to get drunk novelty t-shirt, a pair of off green chonglers, and mismatched flip flops. The other was the gentleman whom he was currently sharing a camel back with, a collar popped cap wearing orc frat boy with a pierced ear, expensive shades, and a porno tread apparently running on set shades shadow run story time 1. Yo yo yo, ma boy satan here says you be doing some shadow runcing up in this bitch. Well the only run in I'm be doing is after I get me some pussy, Norm Zane. Jackson turned to Dervish. Do I know you from somewhere, Brossomite Sam? Dervish's eyebrows narrowed over his mirror shades. Was that supposed to be a play on Street Samurai? Nor, Brissetta Stone, I just be keeping it real, this shit's energy drink and vodka, yo, I be getting mad unrecognizing of everyone and shit. No, Terence. I don't think you know me. Cool, yo, feel free to drink and party, yo, it's all on my new best friend here's bill. Just one thing, since I'm RB not up to recognizing nobody soon, yo, ya feel me, Sammy? What is it? Jackson handed Dervish a cred stick with 50 new yen on it. You a runner, right? You be seeing that nerd fool Simon Berkowitz, you rough his ass up mad crazy, Norm Sane? Uh, sure, Mr. Jackson, I'll crazy his rough up, or whatever the fuck. Good man, my man the Mofrakin vampire here vouches for you. Together we be makin on all the bitches of the night. Fucking Bruce Faritu. Bitches be sucking our dicks while we be sucking their blood, here. Blood sucking Brosquitus, concurred adversary, who was completely sober and evidently having the time of his life. Okay, we'll make sure the nerd doesn't show up, Terence, said Wildcard, rubbing his temples. Till then, we got business to take care of inside. Jackson's eyes widen. Oh shit. Brosine toe, bruh. I didn't realize you had. He pelvis thrusted obscenely, clearly mimicking horrible frat party bathroom sex. Business. Don't let me stop you from getting ya free con. With that, he attempted to chest bump wildcard, knocking the unprepared wildcard on his ass. Jackson screamed, woo. Party and then disappeared into the crowd. Devish turned to Geppetto's puppeted body as adversary fiddled with his host's new earring. You're not going to, like, kill these kids or anything, right? Well, today I figured that facilitating a truly record amount of date rape applied to the evil quota too. Devish sighed and moved into the frat house. God damn it, adversary. That's the spirit. Meanwhile, Ben followed Greg Hampton past the campus and then the campus neighborhood, as the football player, phone at his ear, made for the freeway on foot. Ben followed him to an underpass with a small shanty town beneath it. Ben watched as Hampton fingered a small holdout pistol in his pocket. Evidently the privileged human kid wasn't too keen on heading into the bad parts of town. The question was, why was he here in the first place? Bend continued to follow him as he seemed to peek at and survey the destitute homeless beneath the bridge. He was clearly looking for something, and as he neared a pile of rags with what vaguely looked like an unkempt grey beard peeking out of them, he seemed to have found what he was looking for. Hampton nudged at the pile of rags, and in an instant it seemed to rise up, as though reforming from a puddle. Hampton was speaking to a tall homeless man. Most of him was obscured by rags and hair, but Bend could make out a few cybernetic implants, most prominently two prosthetic hands. Even though he had cyber eyes, and a recent model at that, something crazy seemed to glint in them. Watcher want, not Willie the homeless man scratched at his face harshly, his metallic fingers bruising the flesh. His blank face betrayed an empty mind. I heard ya had something for me. 
something for me to do. I like doing things. You got the money? You got the money for me? Hampton held out a cred stick, and the homeless man snatched it out of his hand. Yeah, yeah. This'll keep me going. This is good. Who ya want done? Not Willy. Hampton nervously brought up an AR window showing Emily Granger, with a marker identifying her current location at the frat party. Rees wants you to scream something about liberals or Carmichael before you do her, if at all possible. Something to make it look good for the media. Seriously, Red. We need this to look like a free conservative thing. Don't worry about me. I'll do it. Do it like you say. Make Willy proud. Red's a good Willy. Ben slid into hiding as the homeless man identified as Red began to walk towards him. He caught a glimpse of Sir legs moving beneath the rag. New models. Powerful. And then his blood went cold, as Red passed by him. Bent could feel it, in the astral. A screaming soul, rendered mad by unholy bindings, chained to a rotting face stapled onto a metal head. He was all machine, except for the little bits of flesh that still qualified him as something that might once have been human. As Red's legs unfolded into skimmer discs and he picked up speed, revealing a powerful metal mech chassis beneath the rags, Bent sent a message to his team, Cyber Zombie. Wildcard threw himself into his car and screeched into action, beelining to pick Bend up. Code bloody fucking red, everyone, Bend. Meet me on 5th and National, and get in the car fucking quick, dovish. Grab the girl and for the love of god wake Geppetto up. We do not have room for error here. As Wildcard swerved towards the freeway underpass, he saw the little murder hobo flying past down the middle of the street, breaking the side mirrors off passing cars as he flew. He moved with such force that he literally caused the cars to rock. A motorcyclist made the mistake of getting in his way and was tossed with his motorcycle into the side of a nearby storefront. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, that's what we're up against. Bend Dukes of hazarded through the passenger side window. Drive. Get back to the frat house. Wildcard spun his car into a donut and flashed down the wrong side of the street, slowly gaining on the speeding cyber zombie. Dervish had just finished bodily grabbing the screaming girl away from Jonathan Rees and out the door as the zombie, its tattered rags flying wildly from the force of its thrusters, crashed clean through the ceiling of the frat house in pursuit. I found you Willy. Dervish did the first thing that his instinct said to do, and that was to charge. As he received a skull fracture in his newly reinforced super dense stone thick skull, no less courtesy of a flying, decoated titanium fist, and promptly crashed through the plaster of one of the frat house's walls into one of the bedrooms, he realized that charging was a mistake. I I I saw you will e. The zombie clambered through the hole in the wall in a quadrupedal fashion more becoming of a predatory primate than something that was once a human being. I wanted her but I found you. I found Yahoo. Dervish backed into the adjacent bathroom and then boosted, smashing the tile floor as he rammed both blades into the zombie's torso. He looked down in disbelief to find that the blades had each only pierced an inch or so in, and that red was leaking a blackish fluid. The zombie grabbed Dervish by the throat and flung him back in a pitching motion. Before Dervish could get over the vertigo, he was outside on the pavement with several broken ribs and the vague awareness that he'd gone through at least two more walls. He scrambled to his feet, his vision a blurry red haze. His AR readouts gave him dire medical warning. He looked up to see, blurry on his left, his teammates and the terrified girl in the car. On his right was the Cyber Zombie, which plowed clean through the front door of the frat house rather than opening it. Crowds of screaming students fled into the street. Why don't you stay will you? E. Why don't you stay? Dervish threw himself into the car. Spitting up blood and what he was pretty sure was one of his tusks, he said one word, but he said it with all the emphasis he could muster. Drive. The team tore out of the university district at 200 miles per hour. Its face contorted in an expression of loss and anguish. The cyber zombie boosted to keep up and scrambled at the back of the car, but it simply couldn't make the speed necessary to catch them. As the team disappeared into the streets of Seattle, they wondered what exactly they'd stumbled into. Shadow Run Story Time 12N. And that's where I'll call it for the night, since Geppetto's player, his girlfriend, and my girlfriend want to play some drunken Mario Party. And I'm sorry, but drunken Mario Party is super important to me. I will keep the thread up on my computer, but expect my responses to get disjointed. And perhaps concern my deep love of Wario. As per usual, this is now Shadow Run General. I know, like, I'm really bad at this. Um, whenever it comes to doing, like, you know, Shadow Run or Cold Shoulder, it just always feels like something just gets in the way. You know, I'm, I'm really trying to get on track. Like, you know, but like, we'll just get there. Um, 
I love the Shadowgun series. And, like, you know, and I actually feel like I miss them almost whenever I don't cover them in ages. It's like, oh, yeah, come on, let's get, let's get back at them, you know? And, uh, like, you know, he doesn't love TD and the gang. Like, you know, I think they're great. The great, like, it's just a really good storyline. Um, and, like, you know, like, we're already half, God knows how many videos we're into it. And um, we've still got a fair bit to go before the end, so that's nice. And hopefully I'll just try and get it done before, like, you know, it starts taking the piss. Like, you know, we did start this video series, what, back in August, I think? So we're quite far in, and like, you know, what the fuck? <laughs> What's going on here? But like, we'll get there. And same with uh, the cold shoulder. Cold shoulder, although I will say, I don't think, I think I'm just going to finish it at the um, third thread. Like, you know, I'm near finished the third thread. And, you know, the problem is, it's because the sisters of battle don't come back, which is a bit of a shame because they're like my favorite characters on it even though the guy that likes them doesn't like me at all which i think is kind of funny but sure what can you do um but no i think i'm gonna leave the cold shoulder at you know the end of this third thread and look, i just hope you guys enjoy it uh because i'll be honest with you i think the quality does go down and look i won't i won't i won't take you any longer you know what i mean um all i can say is like subscribe if you haven't already i know it'd be sh i'd be really shocked if you haven't already and you're already this deep into the shadow gun stories but like whatever check it out and also like you know, check out the discord and i'll leave you to it and hopefully there won't be too much of a wait for the next cold shoulder we'll be out soon all right if you haven't already check out my red bubble portfolio you might just find something you like Just stop! Just stop it! Stop! No! Just stop it! It's time to stop! It's time to stop, okay? No more! Where the fuck are your parents? Who are your parents? I'm gonna call Child Protective Services! It's time to stop!